one. First and foremost, I just want to say, if you're a good tenant in an apartment or in your local neighborhood owning a home, people will love you. Your kindness and cooperative nature will radiate like warmth to your neighbors. An aura of camaraderie and love naturally follows. Please be that neighbor. Don't hesitate to go out of your comfort zone and help your neighbors feel welcome and loved. And now on to the nightmare scenario. This will undoubtedly bother many of you as it did me. A few days prior to my birthday, I was awoken to my neighbor who resides behind my attached garage, completely blocking my exit. Mind you, I have a racing edition electric vehicle, he has a cheap Ford. Every chance he has tried, he has wanted me to show the car to him. Before all of this happened, he boasted immediately by stating he has an Instagram and makes his own content and does reviews to make money. I congratulated him on this and avoided the topic and went about my day to retrieve the mail that day. Anytime I passed him, minding my own business, it was always a loud hodgepodge of boasting, bragging, self-praising, and crowning himself as the most successful person ever, followed by constant swear words and vulgarity. Ever since then, it felt like I was on his hit list. He knew I was his complete opposite. I just didn't want to get to know him. He knew I didn't want him near my car, at which point I started noticing fairly quickly that he was going to make my life as hellish as possible. Going back to the blocking incident of his Ford, I approached my garage and I could see him working on his car. The moment I started backing out, he moved his body directly in my reverse path. I kid you not, my car makes a loud white noise to help people know I am approaching like a Tesla. And he was not wearing earphones or laying prone, as though he wanted to get run over. I pulled out gently and waited. I was watching him through the rearview camera. I could see he had angled his head to see me, then continued working, without moving laying prone in the middle of the apartment complex road, completely blocking the entire road. At that moment, I knew he was purposely trying to block me in. After two minutes of waiting, he got the idea, and barely moved and laid at an angle exactly the moment I tried to pull out. I was able to avoid him. There were delivery trucks, Amazon, that were waiting during this entire ordeal. I was able to finally run errands. I came back and he was gone. I realized, wow, this guy really is not smart. Maybe it was a one-time thing. I was able to enter my garage uninhibited. The next week, rather than he being prone, willing to get himself run over, he now parked his car closer to my garage, so it would force me to pull an Austin Powers reverse scenario, inching slowly, angle by angle. This would happen roughly three times. After a considerable amount of time, I contacted the police. They stated to reach management. I reached out to them, and they stated they would talk to him. Today, he decided to take vengeance on me. He did the same thing, but decided to provide insult to injury by parking his car close to mine in front of his own garage, and leave it open. Then go into his apartment to ignore me when I asked him to move. It was four hours of essentially being held hostage, unable to enter or leave my apartment complex. He was nowhere to be seen. Something tells me he saw me trying at least four times to enter my garage while he blocked it. In his apartment, looking through the windows and enjoying my frustration. I called the same group, the police management, this time maintenance and finally security. Security was the most helpful because they had the most control of the situation. Eventually they arrived and I waved them down. I stated the whole issue, that I was being held from parking in my own garage that I paid for from a kid who refused to park closer to his own garage. Security was phenomenal. He wrote up a report, then stepped out of his cruiser and confronted the culprit. I hid almost out of view so I could peek over and see what was happening. The kid looked around and pointed to my garage, finally realizing what he had done, which I know he was doing on purpose to give me grief. Security waited as the kid pulled his car forward, watching him like a parent, disciplining a child. About one minute afterward, to keep things cool, I opened my garage and casually, easily, was able to navigate inside. The moment I was pulling in, I noticed he was staring from his garage. Now you decide to show up, I said in my car so he couldn't hear me. 
I kid you not, I could sense his seething as he had to comply. For once in his life, he had to do something he was told. And I could tell he didn't like it. As I pulled into my own paid garage, he stared, drinking his drink, staring, waiting for... Mm, something. I turned off my car. He was standing there, waiting. It looked like he wanted to confront me, as I could see he was trying to intimidate me. I had this strong feeling that told me remain in your car and if you step out, have 911 on speed dial, he can't be trusted. I kid you not, it had to have been one or two minutes of him staring at me. He was looking directly in my mirror to see my face trying to intimidate me. Afterward, he backed off. He finally backed down, had a nice gulp of his drink, turned on his garage light, stepped into his apartment, and closed the garage. What he doesn't know is that I have a view of the entire surroundings in case he tries to damage the car, my car, or do anything to endanger my safety. My car also has proximity cameras in the event of a collision event or robbery. What do you guys recommend at this point? My objective is to completely avoid this guy at all costs. My car is safe and stored, but this man seems like he will snap at the drop of a hat simply because he has to share the road. Thanks for listening if you made it this far. Hellfreezer's note. It is possible that you hurt his delicate little feelings when he first approached you, and he's having trouble accepting that. But the fact of the matter is, some people think that the main character, and they can't stand rejection. That is his problem. You owe him no apologies. You owe nothing to him. You have a right to your privacy, you have a right to privacy in your home, you have the right to the privacy of your vehicle. Essentially, all you can do is monitor the situation, maybe have a security camera installed on, just focused on your garage if possible. But beyond that, just live your life. He doesn't sound like much of a threat, although I think he would definitely like to be. Don't let him think he is. He's a little weasel. Two. I always had problems with these neighbors from hell and his friends. When they arrived in April of 2023, they cut down my avocado tree and continued until all that was left was a stump. They stole my broom and bucket for themselves. They insulted me whenever I passed by their house. Call me a drug addict monkey, my mom a dog, my sisters prostitutes, and my dad an old coward. They refused to clean up after their dogs and keep their music down, and instead would retaliate. To avoid that, I reported them to our landlord and police since May 2023. Officially, this started on October 15th, 2023, when I had begun documenting the harassment towards me. That day, I woke up to him being drunkenly racist, shouting things like, I have papers you don't. I'm an American and you're an illegal immigrant. I will call lies on your ass. I am more right than you. I took offense to that, and we argued a shouting match. I stopped until he began to threaten my life by saying I better watch out, that I would find out if he saw me, and he would wait for me to beat me up, educate me, and send his son after me. Throughout the day and night, he would continue to say those things. He waited for my parents downstairs to tell them the same thing, since that day, I never interacted with them again. Unfortunately, that did not matter to him. He made it his mission to become a nuisance to me for whatever reason he could find or cause. On March 3rd, 10.50pm, he threw a beer bottle at me as I was walking to my parents' car to pick up laundry. On June 9th, he dumped blue paint on my plants and a rock near my window. That is when I decided to get cameras for my protection and to prove that he would not leave me alone. From June 25th through June 29th, they built multiple barriers to block the view of my cameras, threatened me with legal action, waited for me downstairs, and bragged that they knew when I would go out and come back through their cameras. On June 29th and 30th, they dumped frying oil or grease onto my plants. On July 4th, he threw a cinder block on the sidewalk, cracking it. On July 5th and August 26th, their friend was caught purposely littering around my plants. From July 10th through the 13th, they intentionally used a speaker and a blender next to my window. As early as 9am, and as late as 2am. On July 13th, after being convinced by my neighbor from hell, their friend confronted me about the cameras, threatening me with legal action. 
On July 20th, they came home drunk and angry. He followed my family a total of six times. While doing so, he recorded us with his phone without permission, referred to us as Indian and indigenous people with his speaker, and threatened us with legal action until I took my cameras down. He attempted to get into my apartment, urinated on the shared exterior water faucet, stole my camera, and used a ladder to hit my other camera and window with a broom. Throughout the day and night, they waited for me to come down, tried to investigate by playing loud music, mocking me and my family about being nothing more than Indians and indigenous people cursing us to go to hell, and threatening to prevent my dad from coming home, bragging about how he stole my camera and how he will get away with it because he can do and say whatever he wants. He persisted until 2 a.m. The police came twice, at 9 p.m. and 4 a.m. I showed them the camera footage and they had him pay for the stolen camera. After they left, he did not leave me alone until the landlord contacted him the next day. On July 27th, he used his phone again to record my mom and sister without permission. On August 11th and 12th, he drunkenly screamed and shouted for hours being a nuisance. On August 15th, his partner spied on us with his phone looking through our window. On August 24th, he yelled at my sisters and sister to inform them it was his birthday, so he could do whatever he wanted. Throughout this ordeal, I contacted a housing organization to pressure my landlord into evicting these people. The best they got out of him was my neighbor promising to leave me alone. When that didn't work, I contacted a lawyer and was told there was no guarantee to get a restraining order, regardless of the evidence. Even if I get one, there is no guarantee they will stop either, and worsen the situation. The best advice they could give me was to move elsewhere. However, if I were to go through with this, just for a chance at a piece of paper, it might cost me around 20 grand. With this situation going on for this long without anything changing for the better, I've given up hope. I will become what I hate and become their neighbor from hell. Hell Freezer's note, nothing's going to change about your living situation, you just need to move. I'm sorry to put it so bluntly, but that really is the best option. You and your family need to get out of there and find a better situation. I know it feels like letting them win, but at this point, it's very obvious that even those that should be helping you are unwilling to lift a finger to help you any more than they absolutely have to. The bare minimum seems to be what's being done. Although you could stay and just keep documenting and continuing to call the authorities, continue to contact the landlords and any other agencies you're able to. If it happens enough, then something might eventually get done. I'd be very surprised if you were the only people they were harassing. So I'd maybe talk to your neighbors about that too, if you could. 3. 2001, I had just moved to a quiet neighborhood where my children, 1 and 3, could play outside safely and grow up with neighborhood children. It was also nice for my cats, 3, to be able to run around the house. After the first week, it was our first garbage day. Everything neatly in closed bags and in our personal garbage container. In the morning, we had to place the container on the side of the road with the rest of the containers on our street, so it was there at 7 a.m. After which, I started cleaning my house. I had a white floor because I liked it and that way I knew for sure that it was clean. I mopped daily. I was still extremely clean at that time because of crawling children then I did the shopping, and when I got home, I was in shock after opening my front door. My entire hall was full of unknown waste. Broken glass, sharp can lids, pieces of fruit, papers and plastics, etc. Clearly stuffed through the letterbox. I already saw a number of neighbors looking at me expectantly behind their windows and in front of their house. It was clear they knew more. After asking around, I was told who had thrown the garbage in my house. Conscious neighbor had done this, with much fanfare. Something snapped inside me. A bomb in my frontal lobe and all decency disappeared from my mind. Steam from my ears. I cleaned out the trash and put the kids in the living room. Then I cleaned the cat litter box. Normally, I throw the entire contents in a bag. But now I was a bit more precise. I only scooped the crap and urine lumps out of the box and divided it evenly between two small bags, those thin ones that tear quickly. I took the bags and went to the neighbor further down the street. I rang the doorbell and kept the bags behind me. The lady opened the door with a smug grin in her face. The door opened wide and I could quickly see her hall. On the right, a carpeted staircase, 
and on the left, the open door to the living room. The hall continued for another 1.5 meters to the back after the stairs and door, where her toilet was. Everything was super clean. I asked her devilishly calmly if she had put that waste through my letter box. Her answer was yes, followed by the reasoning that because I was new here, that the loose waste that was lying around the place containers must have been mine, because before we lived here that never happened. That was the moment that all blood vessels in my eyes burst, the calm was gone. In a tirade of abuse I made it clear to her that I had not been the polluter and that if she had any decency, she could have spoken to me instead of jumping to conclusions and dirtying my house and endangering my crawling children and animals by dumping that waste in my house like that. With the message that she liked to clean up so much, here, please, and I threw the two bags in her hallway. One against the corner of the stairs and the other on the door outpost of the living room. Everything, really everything, was covered in crap and splattered clumps of cat urine. With a warning and promise that if she ever thought of doing something like that again, I would smash all her windows. I turned around and went home. Everyone had seen and heard everything. Never heard anything from that neighbor again. No one ever thought of crossing me something like that again. I can still enjoy the face she pulled when she saw the bags flying. It was shock, fear, indignation, nausea, and despair all at once. 4. I am a 29-year-old male, and my fiancé is 27 and female. We moved into what we thought was a great apartment in Los Angeles. The only complaint we had were strange knocking sounds coming from the floor, which sounded like someone banging a broom handle against the ceiling below us. They'd come at random intervals, with no external stimulus. Example, we'd just be sitting on the couch reading when the banging would start. At other times, they would wake us in the middle of the night. Strange. First encounter. After about eight months of this, my fiancé walks past a man in his late seventies in the lobby of our building. He starts snarling and swearing at her, and follows her through the lobby and into the building parking lot. She runs to her car and drives away. He keeps glaring at her the entire time, watching her go. I'm livid when I hear that she has been menaced by this stranger, but we have no idea who this person is, so we can't do much about it. The incident was probably captured by security footage, though. My fiancé sends an email to property management to document the incident. Noise escalates. After the new year, music starts blaring from radio downstairs. It's some sort of top 100 station, so we figured some young person had just moved in. Except it never stops. 24-7, all night long, right below our bedroom. We complain to the landlord about this, and they reply that the person living downstairs is an older man, and perhaps he's hard of hearing. In any case, the unit is owned by a different landlord, and there's nothing they can do about it. Okay, maybe he's just an old guy who likes music and didn't realize how loud his speakers were. Annoying, but there are worse things in the world. We buy a ton of earplugs and put up with it. Second Encounter the banging on the floor picks up in intensity and frequency. Now it's accompanied by screaming and profanity. Get the F out of my building, you animals. Stuff like that. The voice is familiar. The volume on his radio cranks up. Standard 30 decibel earplugs no longer block the bass at night. And we're getting little sleep. My fiancé runs into the guy downstairs again. And he starts swearing at her angrily once more. This time... She stands her ground and calmly asks why he's antagonizing her. He reveals that he's the person living in the apartment below us, and that he's angry about the sprays. Sprays? What sprays? He declines to elaborate. I call the cops. I'm fed up now. And as soon as my fiancé tells me what happened, I call the cops. We're pretty low priority, but they show up around midnight. We explain the situation to them, and the cops knock on our downstairs neighbor's door. He does not come out to answer, but he does switch the radio off. The police are sympathetic to us, but they tell us that since he hasn't made any direct threats of violence, this is a civil matter, and there's nothing they can do about it. Talking to the other neighbors. The radio turns back on the next day and plays all through the night. It's so loud the floor starts vibrating. 
I call the HOA every day for the next few days, but they do not respond. I buy an air quality detector and sweep my apartment. No signs of sprays or other air quality issues. I tell my upstairs neighbor about the situation. She's aghast to find out that the knocking that's been bothering her was coming from two floors below. And she tells me that it's been going on for five years, long before we moved in. She just assumed that it was coming from us, the floor below her. One mystery resolved, I guess. She tells me his name. Bob. Meeting Bob. I take my air quality sensor and head to the first floor to talk to this guy. When I happen to run into him in the hallway. He has no idea who I am, so I stick to being respectful and polite. I ask him about the sprays and he immediately launched into a deluge about how a mixed-raced lesbian couple lives above him and are poisoning him with ambiguously specified airborne chemicals. He also says they have an electronic device that shocks him remotely at odd hours, particularly at night, and make him incontinent. He claims this has been going on for years and it's getting worse. While he's launching into this, I can't help but notice that his feet and legs are terribly swollen. He's wearing sandals, diabetes can of course cause similar edema, and can also cause neuropathy that many people describe as being similar to electric shocks. In rare cases, it can also cause phantasmia, olfactory hallucinations that some people describe as strong, persistent chemical odor. Diabetes is not the only possible medical culprit. Chronic kidney disease can also do this. Note, though, that I am not a doctor. He's pretty deep into his rant. At this point, he's describing how the sprays are making dead bugs stick to his ceiling. So I don't bring this up. I hear him out, sympathetically, and then I tell him that I am, in fact, his upstairs neighbor, and that he's been screaming at my fiancé. He is taken aback, and insists that the same tenants have always lived above him. I tell him no. I'm certain I know where I live, and I know I'm not using chemical sprays or administering any shocks, nor is my fiancé. He suggests that perhaps my fiancé is romantically involved with the lesbian couple in a thruple, formed for apparently no other purpose than to torment him. I tell him that this is unlikely, and that the apartment was actually empty for a number of months last year, he was banging against an empty unit all this time. He's nonplussed. Somehow the lesbians are behind this, but he doesn't know how. I tell him that I'm sorry to hear he's going through whatever he is going through, but I don't know how to help. I tell him he's misidentified my fiance as being part of this, but this has all been a misunderstanding. She's innocent in all this. I ask him to leave my fiance alone and please turn the radio down at night. I also offer to give him the air quality sensor, but he declines. We shake hands and part ways. My fiancé noted that he seems to deal with other men differently than with women. The radio stays off for two weeks. Bob tells me he only blasts it to keep people from spying on him while he's on his computer. Then the radio turns on again and the banging restarts. Bob's in pretty deep. I go downstairs to talk to him again. This time, I actually knock on his door. When he hears he's enraged, he tells me that I've lied to him, that I'm actually in league with the women and their sprays and shocks. He says that the women are living in my closet and bathroom and that he can hear them, and in fact, I don't really live in the apartment at all. I explain that it's just me and my fiancé up there, but he's not having it. I show him my lease, and I tell him that I'm concerned for his health and that the sprays and shocks he's experiencing could be symptoms of a medical condition that he should have evaluated by a doctor. Bob disagrees and finds the lesbian conspiracy to be the more probable explanation. He decides that I'm not in on it, though, although he maintains that my fiancé definitely is, that they're breaking in and spraying sprays and sending shocks while I'm asleep or at work. In fact, he declares that the women are probably upstairs in the apartment at that very moment. I invite him up to my place. I give him a full tour of the apartment. No sprays or smells, no women living in the bathrooms or closets, no electric shock devices or bugs on the ceiling. Just a normal, well-kept apartment. He mumbles something about the sprays again, but for the first time he actually seems ponderous. He starts insinuating things about other neighbors, but I tell him that's unlikely too. I remind him I think he should talk to his doctor. He refuses, but we part on good terms. Back to baseline. Two days have passed. 
The radio was back on. The banging has resumed. And it's very likely he's found a new way to reconstruct his conspiracy theory. But with new ways to account for otherwise inconvenient facts. We like our apartment. My fiancé doesn't want to move. And our lease isn't up for another six months. Still, I'm concerned my neighbor may be too delusional to be reasoned with. Hellfreezer's note, you are right. And unless you can contact Bob's family if he has any, although it seems like he may not if he's been allowed to get to this stage without any sort of medical intervention, a trip to a doctor would likely do him the world of good. But as you say, he can't be forced. Perhaps you could ask for a wellness check, say that your neighbor is mentally unstable, yada yada yada. It might help, but quite frankly, it probably won't in the long term. You have six months left there. I think it would be wise to move to another apartment. It might be your only viable option. Perhaps you could find another apartment in the same building, albeit further away from Bob and his closeted lesbians. Quite insensitive of Bob, actually, to put the lesbians in the closet. They likely spent a long time trying to come out. Anyway, whatever happens in the future, I hope you and your fiancé have peace. And that you don't have to put up with banging Bob anymore. 5. Oh, Jesus. Whew. Okay, I don't know where to begin. I just need somewhere other than Twitter to vent about this. I need to vent so bad. I'm a 27-year-old woman with a slew of disabilities. To try and keep this short, I'm going to mention the two most prominent, severe PTSD and pre-diabetes caused by PCOS. I will explain why these disabilities are for context later. I am constantly yelled at through the paper-thin walls for flushing my toilet, using any water at all, and most recently, I overheard my neighbour having a very loud phone call with someone who I presume is her friend, complaining about how I leave my lights on all night. I suffer from a severely bad case of PTSD, from being brutalised by my family and others, where I frequently have really, really bad night terrors, so as a form of precaution, I need to have a light on in my apartment at night in case I have a night terror. Reason being, if I cannot see my surroundings when I wake up from a night terror, there is a possibility that I might involuntarily run around crying while half awake, and wake up on the floor, hiding against a wall. The night terrors used to be so bad I would scream and wail in pain, because the muscle tension was so bad. It's not pretty, so I have to take special care of myself when it comes to my sleeping routine. There's no medicine or anything that can help me. Luckily, I haven't screamed or cried in pain and fear in many years. More so, now I just wake up stiff, a little sore and panicky, and have to practice grounding techniques while laying in bed and try to fall back asleep. A major game changer has just been leaving a light on at night, so I feel comfort seeing my surroundings upon waking from the night terrors. This has never bothered my neighbors until recently, and I haven't got a clue as to why. I pay for my own utilities, this doesn't even impact them. They are next door neighbors too, so like it's not like the light is keeping them awake. It's just not lights that upset them. This was very recently they became irate by my light. It's also the water. I use water and it fills her with rage. For context, we have a mid-water pressure issue. When either of us uses water, it briefly affects the water pressure for the other. But it goes back to normal within seconds. I try to never flush if I hear her using the shower, but also, it seems when I flush my toilet between the hours of 6pm to 7am, she will complain about it. Usually it's something along the lines of, Oh my effing god, that effing bitch, the effing water, come on, are you effing kidding me? Use all the effing water. What the have? Stop flushing your effing toilet all the time! I'm pre-diabetic. I do have to urinate more than the average person, but me using my own toilet should not make someone that angry. She also seems to inconsistently yell at me or complain if I use any water at all, i.e. if I need to shower, brush my teeth, get a glass of water or do my dishes, there's a 50-50 chance that she will get unreasonably angry with me. I mentioned this to maintenance, whose response was, what the actual... Let me know if that happens again, I'll talk to the landlords. 
My landlords are very hard to reach because it's an elderly couple who refuses to use email, and they constantly change their phone number. When the next door neighbors flush if I'm in the shower, I don't yell at them. The water pressure comes back instantly. I was wondering if they just don't like the sound of any water running. Also adding, the fact that I became so afraid to flush my toilet that I had to let urine and poo stew in it overnight really made me depressed because it's gross and unhygienic. And I need to keep my apartment clean and mostly spotless or I get stressed out. So having to constantly re-bleach my toilet daily to prevent grossness was getting annoying. I said screw that and flush whenever I want to, because I am an adult and I will not be made afraid in my own apartment, especially after all I have been through. But no, it turns out it's any sound I make at all that sends them into a pure rage. We share a wall, it unfortunately has poor sound deadening. I am a relatively quiet woman, I have no friends, I do however have a girlfriend who comes to visit, maybe at most twice a month. We like to cuddle and play video games in my bedroom, which is the furthest room away from the wall side of the apartment. There are a few times where we did laugh really hard at a video game, but we quiet down by 8pm and wind down for the night well before then. But for some reason my neighbours are allowed to be loud, just not me. Even so much as me stirring about annoys them. I cannot stress this enough. I am constantly tiptoeing around my apartment, walking on eggshells in my own apartment, and is starting to make my PTSD worse. I grew up in a very volatile household where I was similarly yelled at and insulted for getting water or eating or doing anything by my cut contact abusive mother. It just reeks of that all over again. My neighbors are a Gen X couple, I assume, in their late 40s. There's a woman and a man. The boyfriend apparently isn't even on the lease, but that's not really my business at all. She has complained to both my landlord and her friends loudly over the phone about me bringing an effing girlfriend over all the time. Again, no more than two times a month, because we both work and live a semi-long distance. She stays for a day or two. And I find it hypocritical that she has a whole guy who, mind you, is not even on her goddamn lease that lives there all the time. Which this past week, an ambulance came because he overdosed on something. He's fine now, but like, I got woken up by a bright ambulance parked next to my truck and hearing the calamity right next door. They are using drugs, but I cannot understand what drug makes someone so angry and volatile like that. I'm starting to wonder if the neighbor might be homophobic, but I have experienced genuine homophobia from my own relatives who abused me for being a lesbian and completely cast me out and beat me, etc. I don't want to throw the homophobia card just yet. Other notable things I have done, which I have had to drop 50 bucks on a security camera for, I think they keyed my truck. I have no proof, though, so it could have been anyone. The boyfriend threw a cigarette butt in my truck's open window. I constantly hear the boyfriend vomiting through the walls, but don't say anything. The lady calls her friend really loudly to bitch about me. She has also bitched about me going to the gym so much. The sound of my vehicle going in and out across the gravel driveway apparently infuriates her. Bitching about me every time I left or came home from work because, again, she couldn't stand the sound of my front door opening and closing or my wheels crumbling over the gravel driveway. She yelled at her cat once, and it made me sad. I'm probably missing something, but uh, I wish I could afford to move because this is breaking me. I'm not doing anything wrong. Yes, I'm trying to gather evidence in case this escalates further. It's been getting worse as time goes on. She's lived next door to me for maybe eight months now? Maybe less? I don't know what to do. I have a camera in my apartment, pointed at my truck and front door just in case any other vandalism occurs. We live on a ground floor, I don't know if I should mention that. Does her behavior sound like abuse, or am I just crazy? If you managed to listen to all this, thank you. Hell Freezer's note. It definitely does sound abusive, and my initial thought was maybe homophobia, but it sounds like she would probably be complaining about anyone living next door to her. The walls might be thin, but the fact of the matter is it sounds like they're just looking for excuses to be mad at anyone who happens to be living next door to them. Any sound would set them off. I would think about reporting them if the boyfriend isn't on the lease there. That is certainly a violation, and the landlords would 
definitely like to know about that. But make sure you protect yourself first. Don't let them find out it was you. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Naughty Neighbors episode 13. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't done so already. If you'd like to help out the channel, then you can do that by becoming a channel member. There are three different tiers available for you. And if you'd like to get early access to the videos and just pay a what you feel kind of thing, you can do that through Patreon, which is linked for you in the description, as well as my merchandise store and Discord. Tips are also still an option if you'd like to do that. Okay, no other business today, so let's move along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... Are you a shower in the morning or a shower at the end of the day kind of person? Uh, no judgments either way. Personally, I like to shower at the end of the day, as it's my way of sort of settling in for the evening. Or at least uh, settling in as far as I know I'm not going to be going out again. Like, uh, next time I go out, possibly tomorrow, actually it'll have to be tomorrow, I have to pick some things up. When I come home, I'll have, I'll have a shower, and then I'll get myself all set, and then I'll settle into work. But I won't be going out the house again to do any more errands or any other things. So let me know what you think in a comment below, and before we go, let's have a look at the answer of the day from a previous video. And this was from Naughty Neighbours 12, and it was about uh, the kind of footwear you wear all year round. And today's answer comes from... And the Sierra. I would wear my Converse all year round if winter wasn't so darn cold and icy here. Did it when I couldn't afford winter boots. When I moved to Montreal. Never again. Thank you very much for your answer, Enza. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening. And take very good care of yourself.